Yeah. So therefore, when you look at, let's say, the glass half empty theory of the perennial pessimists, as you call them, would you tell them that the real challenge that you also accept is ensuring that expenditure on health and education in particular, providing not just uh, uh, literacy, uh, in that you're able to provide quality education that makes the job market. That's going to be India's biggest. So, see, here I think, you know, on education and healthcare. Mm -hmm. But let me remind, you know, especially the viewers, that education and healthcare are actually not just the responsibility of the center. They're actually concurrent subjects, number one. Number two, when it comes to education, the solution is not more money because our teachers, especially those in government, you know, are paid well. And if you look, by, look at several papers, people like, you know, uh, uh, Karthik Muralidhar and others have actually written, showing that it is the governance that needs to change, which is primarily a state-level subject, number one. So, mm -hmm. but the, again, I'm just saying, you know, who needs to do the work? I'm not saying there isn't work to be done. On healthcare as well, I think while there's been significant improvement, and I, let me acknowledge, you know, we on a per capita basis during COVID, I think we did really well uh, by coming up with our own vaccine. You know, I shudder to think about actually, let's say, in a different dispensation, the kind of policy paralysis that prevailed earlier, what would have been the situation? You know, if the same COVID pandemic had happened in sort of such kind of dispensation, I think there would have been absolute mayhem. Um, you know, and I think that is important to actually recognize. In the spirit of, you know, recognizing wherever good work has been done, I think we must say that too. The, the other challenge challenge, of course, which I briefly mentioned upon was manufacturing. And since you quoted Arvind Panagriya more than once, his big concern mm -hmm. is that the PLI schemes that the government has brought in, uh, that we need to relook at some of them, that we need to ensure uh, that uh, somewhere customs du uh, duty hikes need to be reversed. We can't be protectionist in this new world. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to ensure that trade barriers are lifted. We're going to have to reach out to the world. Do you concede that perhaps that is another major challenge going ahead if we have to really compete with the global economies? Yeah, I, you know, on manufacturing, there is actually a lot of work still to be done. Um, let me explain, you know, to our viewers, because this is something that's generated debate. Let me you know, in 1991, and allow me actually to explain this here, mm -hmm. please don't interrupt. Um, in 1991, we liberalized the economy. But what we did not do was, you know, really sort of work on, ex work, you know, on, on those factors of production that manufacturing firms use. For instance, manufacturing firms need power. Manufacturing firms need land. Manufacturing firms need labor. They also need, you know, to transport their, 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 their uh, what they produce. And their scale needs to be big enough so that their costs can be spread over a large denominator. Each of these are costs that manufacturing firms incur. And our policy has actually, you know, we did not do anything on these, in these factor markets to actually enable our firms to be competitive. What happens is our manufacturing firms, on each one of these inputs, they face anywhere between 15 to 20 percent higher costs than global firms. Mm -hmm. When you add all these up, you basically are looking, our firms are looking at almost double the cost. Even the most, you know, creative entrepreneur can possibly reduce his or her costs by 20, 30 percent. But when the cost is actually double, and this is something that actually has been a policy failure, which has been, you know, uh, which this government has tried to address. If you look at the labor reforms, actually, the bill has been passed, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in Parliament. The economies of scale, actually, we had the problem of dwarfism. Firms actually, you know, growing old but not growing in size, thereby really reaping economies of scale. That has not happened, had not happened, has now actually been changed, MSME definitions. The infrastructure spending that is happening has been happening in power and has been happening, you know, in, 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 in roads and railways so that logistics costs you know, are, are, are taken care of. Now, when you put all this together, it's, there is nobody has a magic wand. It's not going to happen overnight, but actually the momentum is, is very much there. If you look at the latest, the monthly economic report that the Ministry of Finance has put up, it, they show very clearly that private investment, that is new private investment into manufacturing, is really actually you know, is, is at a 14 year high, year high. So clearly there is you know good work that is being done, but there's a lot more work still to be done on, on manufacturing. One final uh, uh, contentious issue is the charge of cronyism, the charge that few are benefiting at the many, that mm -hmm. many of these infrastructure projects are going to only a handful of, of businessmen, and 
the real fear that it appears that many of our dollar millionaires are actually leaving the country, are looking to park their money outside India, whether it's in a Dubai, whether it's in a Singapore, and that should worry you. If all is so well, why is it that so many people are, are, are looking at options outside India? And do you really accept, do you believe that the charge of cronyism uh, should be looked at seriously or not? So you've asked me two questions here. Let me take your second question first, which is about, you know, uh, people leaving, etc. Let me, I'll give you an honest assessment here. Uh, and they seem to be fearful of, of, of the fact that the laws do not equally apply. So let me, you know, uh, uh, as I was saying, in terms of people basically wanting to leave the country, look, I lived in the United States from 2001 to 2010. Mm -hmm. And now I'm for the na last eight months, I'm living in the United States again. And, you know, I've tweeted about this and I'm being absolutely honest. When I lived from 2001 to 2010, you know, when I was seeing what is happening in the United States, I would not see something in India that made me say, oh, wow, this is actually much better in India than in the United States. But today, when I live in the United States, there are multiple things, including being able to actually use my phone to pay for something, actually, whether I drink a co piece of coconut water or maybe a coffee, I can do that far better in India than actually in the United States. That's just one aspect. So, so I don't our know. Digital infrastructures are big, public digital infrastructures are big strength. Our fear is the way laws are applied in this country, unequally applied uh, laws that are seen to be draconian, fear of, uh, uh, of uh, punitive action, all of which is driving money out. Uh, so as I said here, you know, if you look at the evidence on this, on a... You know, if you normalize using the correct pace, I don't think this phenomenon actually is as, you know, as, as bad as you're portraying it to be. I'm, I will admit that I've not look at, looked at the data on this particular, so I will not speculate, mm -hmm. but I don't trust what you're actually telling me here. Okay, I'm, I'm going by the reports that have come out. In 2023, 6,500 Indian millionaires expected to leave India, according to the Henley Private Wealth Migration Report. These are numbers coming out, but also anecdotally, when you talk to businessmen, there is a fear factor. There is a fear so, factor so me, that in, will institutions operate, institutions operate in an equal, effective manner. See, th th I, that's what I mentioned. When you look at raw numbers, right, you have to use a certain base because just 6,500 in and itself, when you have population growing itself, without a certain normalization of the base, those numbers mean nothing, really. You have to be careful in actually mm -hmm. in interpreting these numbers. It may be 6,500, actually, but if you go to a time, let's say, 20 years back, you know, where the population was very different, you know, may, the number may, be, may have been 5,000, actually, so you can't really interpret that. Arbitrariness in implementation of laws. Is, 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 that is something which actually state capacity, you know, in... Is, is an aspect that India has to work on. It's not something that has been a problem just now. It has been a problem always. Right. We need to really, you know, work on improving state capacity significantly in the country. That's as, apart from, as I said, continued work on manufacturing, continued work on, you know, some of the infrastructure, healthcare, education. Also, state capacity is something that requires work. I'm not going to deny that at all. Again, the spirit of what I'm trying to say is actually this, you know, one, not acknowledging what is happening well, and moving the targets all the time. Oh, growth happened, okay, tell me about social expenditure. If I say social expenditure, okay, tell me about something else about the laws. And that's what, you know, I'm trying to actually, you know... Fair, uh, uh, fair, fair, so, point, uh, fair point, Mr. Subramanian. So what now about, let me come what to about the cro cronyism? cronyism? Yeah, so again, here, you know, if you want to talk about cronyism, we could do a two-hour session, you know, because I've written a lot about this, you know, uh, the, the economic surveys earlier entire slowdown that we had, you know, starting, you know, before 2018-19 was because of the gargantuan amount of crony lending that was done up until 2013. So, you know, again, this is an aspect that actually, you know, uh, uh, we need to really be working on, you know, moving forward. We, remember, are still a 75-year-old democracy. And, you know, institutional checks and balances are evolving. Things are becoming clearly much, much better than what they were 10 years back. You know, I don't think anybody would want to contend that this is something that is completely taken care of. There is still work to be done. But I can tell you, and having been in the North Block, and I speak my mind, I will tell you that, you know, there is not a single instance of, you know, public sector banks basically getting a telephone call and saying lend to X or lend to Y that has happened in the last nine years. I think that is a step in the right direction, sure. which is certainly not indicative of cronyism.